Hello and welcome to Beyond the Headlines on Liberty Television. My name is Anthony Momodu. On today's discourse, we've got a very interesting story. So uh, we'll be looking at uh, oxygen demand in Lagos spikes uh, to 400 cylinders daily. And I will also have uh, trouble for PIB as the uh, host communities insist on 10% equity uh, share. And I will also have some big story coming from Kogi State. It says, uh, Kogi, high-risk states, PTF, uh, a letter and Nigerians is the worrisome story there, and they have also slammed the Yobe, Zamfara, and Kebi State for uh, irregular testing. We also have some big stories saying federal government uh, more the UAE and Netherlands uh, flight uh, suspension. We also got a uh, 7.65 billion naira trial, uh, the fraud uh, uh, consigning former Abia State Governor, talking about Kalu, and uh, we also have the uh, federal government turns uh, to Russia and India for vaccines. Vaccines now to come in April, no longer January, no longer February, but now April. So we'll be looking at that uh, very uh, disturbing occurrence. Then President won't appoint uh, service chiefs based on sentiment or ethnicity, is what the presidency is saying this evening. So we'll be looking at that. Then also, sad story, Tony Momo dies at the age of uh, 82. These and other big stories is what we'll be looking at on today's edition of the program, Beyond the Headlines. And uh, usual suspects, the man uh, who uh, has been super consistent for the last uh, three years, starting from Issa Ali Shatter. Good evening. Nice to have you uh, in the studios, Ali. Good evening. Thank you very much for having me. All right. Uh, next man is the man uh, who is making his second uh, appearance on the program. Godwin uh, Ahmed is his name. Thank you very much. Uh, Godwin, you're looking amazing, just like uh, Issa. You guys are looking really Thank sweet. You. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. Uh, today we decided to bring back uh, one of our beauty queens uh, who deserted us after uh, last year. Now we have her back in the studios. I want to say a big thank you to Blessing Ambrose uh, coming despite all the hurdles she had to cross. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ambrose. Thank nice you. to have you. Thank you, Tony. Nice to be here once again. All right. Uh, now we are ready to go. Uh, be warned, uh, this panel is they're full of uh, fire in their belly, ready to you know, <laughs> chew into the big stories. Let's begin from Lagos where... Oxygen is needed 400 cylinders per day due to COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Issa, what does this tell us how uh, Nigeria is in a very dire situation? The fact that 400 cylinders are used up by just a single state. Yes, uh, Lagos is the epic center, but we thought things were getting better. Uh, again, we have to talk about Nigeria not preparing ahead of time. Um, last year, we all knew that there was COVID. Um, you know, we had decrease, you know, in the spike in Lagos. And, of course, Lagos was the epic center last year. It's still the epic center currently. And we knew before now that we were going to have the second wave as it, it was coming. We knew that we were going to have the demand for these cylinders. Again, why did we fail to plan? That has always been the question. We always fail to plan. We always fail to prepare, even though we know that these things are things that we need. Now, we are all talking about getting vaccines, but we are not even talking about managing what we currently have at the moment. We don't have enough um, isolation centers. We don't have enough um, personal protective gear. We don't have enough of all these, you know, um, 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 items yeah, okay. that we need to at least curtail what we have for now. And to add to that, we now have shortage of cylinders. And what does that tell you? It means a lot of people will be needing oxygen and they won't have one. Oh. And what will happen at the end of the day? We're going to be losing life because of our own carelessness. So I just feel um, a state like Lagos, who I feel is more proactive, you know, in terms of whatever they want to do, they should be proactive enough to have actually envisaged that they will need these cylinders ahead of time, rather than coming out now and crying out for who is going to provide these cylinders. The question is, who exactly do they think will help them at this particular moment? So it's a rhetorical question, question. because yeah. they are supposed to have prepared ahead of time, actually. Godwin, uh, how sad is this commentary, and uh, what are your fears, knowing that Lagos, like you rightly pointed out, is one of the most proactive states. Uh, they seem to even carry on without the federal government's help in most times. Uh, but if Lagos can go through this kind of crisis, can you give us an idea what other states uh, in the Federation would be suffering right now? Uh, thank you very much, Tony. 
it's really worrisome to hear the reports coming from uh, Lagos is a formidable uh, state in the country, a state that uh, whose economy can be likened to some other African nations. Yeah. And uh, I want to believe that uh, Lagos is not really challenged to a large extent with respect to the economic resources that is required to adequately fight uh, the spread of uh, COVID-19. Okay. And uh, if other states would learn from what is happening, uh, I think they should begin to take the right steps. Uh, they've always had the pre-knowledge, the pre-information, because the world is a global place, and I think news are circulating, that there could be a second wave, wave yeah. of the COVID-19 ep uh, epidemic. And obviously, most states don't do anything other than just keep locking people in, not taking adequate measures. It's really very worrisome. I, I don't know what's going to happen to a lot of states, but I don't think it's going to be pleasant especially where the common man is concerned because i always want to speak in favor of the common man and i will always speak against not antagonizing the government but i will always right. speak for the common man who is always downtrodden and then when states like when pressures come the kind of things we see in lagos where private where government owned uh, facilities will become commercialized right. people want to pay what about those who don't have the resources now in other states where the level of uh, income the standard of living is much more lower compared to lagos economic resources are down how would the common Nigeria and the ordinary citizen be able to fit put the bill for the treatment of COVID-19? This is a very important issue we need to be looking at. Yeah, very strong question there for the presidency. Uh, let's, let's, uh, let me bring you into this. Uh, just this morning, uh, we discovered the market and some areas were shut down by the federal government via a court order saying they were not adhering to COVID-19 protocols. Uh, do you think the federal government is measuring on minority things and not you know taking the the real things serious because now we're looking at cylinders short supply in cylinders and um, rather what we're seeing is more of a closing of a uh, market and some other places so do you think the government is putting its priority right yeah i i, I think what um, is glaring is when it comes to uh obeying the laws and orders okay we always hold the minority for them to obey for okay them to be the elite. The, the elite behind thinking and it's like the prayers of the down children are being answered because when you talk about COVID-19 to them, that is political sickness, <laughs> the sickness of the rich. So we, we don't come near me because if you look at the, the number, the statistics, okay. it's the high and the mighty that is attacking and they are dying on a regular basis. And then what you want to enforce, you don't start from the, okay, yep. let's, let's, let's talk about the uh, National Assembly. PDP, question Buhari, why are you implementing this when you, as a leader, is not adhering to this? And then on social media, if you, if you were on story, if you notice on social media, they put two presidents, presidents of the United States and presidents of Nigeria. One was on, with face mask, and the other one was, was not with face mask. They say leadership. So when you talk about leadership, you shouldn't hold a certain sector of uh, people to obey the rules, to obey the order of the land. You should, everybody should obey. Going to the market, yes, I, I, I applaud the, the federal government that everybody must adhere to it. But are we doing selective judgment here? Are we doing selective uh, obedience here? Let everybody be held responsible so that, because if you don't put your hands together, if it affects you, it will definitely affect me sometime, someday. If it doesn't affect me, it might affect my relative, and it goes round like that. So let's hold everybody responsible to implement anything, any order, any rule that is being left down by the people. 
Well, that's a well said there because I will also just to put into perspective uh, the aviation minister, Hadis Rika, had raised issues as regards uh, the elites, uh, those uh, travelers coming into the country and those exiting, not uh, adhering to the COVID-19 protocols and also coming in with thick results of a COVID-19 test. So it tells us uh, what Blessing is saying is right on spot. All right, uh, just last week we had some uh, melodrama during a public hearing uh, concerning the new PIB uh, bill, and uh, it did say trouble for PIB as host communities insist on 10%. Uh, Amir, let me get you from here because I know you're closer to this uh, <laughs> business related uh, than each time we jump into it. Uh, the fact that we saw that drama play out during that public hearing, what does that tell us as regards how troublesome this PIB bill is going to be? It's been on for several years. Last uh, National Assembly couldn't uh, pass it through and we're hoping this time around they're going to get it right but with the drama we're seeing already uh, do you think we're going to succeed uh, basically i i think it's um the issue of the government taking issue of serious matters with levity okay the petroleum industry bill is a welcome idea and if you see a lot of agitations a lot of hostilities coming from the oil producing states that are some part of economic activities and it's telling the impact is so enormous on, on, on the average Nigerian. I keep talking about the average Nigerian is downtrodden the common man because he has no reserve. There are a lot of wealthy people with sufficient reserve, even if things go wrong, they could keep up for, for as long as it's possible until things get better. Now, there are a lot of institutions, bodies coming up, groups coming up, agitating. And I don't think, if you hear the level of corruption in so many quarters in the public sector, I don't think there's anything wrong granting the wishes and desires of the host communities to ensure that um, they develop effectively, having bearing in mind that their their source of livelihood has been affected, their yes. communities have been destroyed. So the 10% should be an inclusion for them, so that we can have at least like they are prob like they are promising that uh, yeah. if they can get the 10%, 10% yeah. hostilities in Nigeria uh, uh, will, will cease. I know I know it wouldn't cease because I know we. There's no end to demands and to wants. Okay. Wants are insatiable. You know, they'll come up with other, other reasons. reasons yeah. But I think there's a need for Nigeria to begin to see how interested parties should be adequately careful. Now you can see corruption in so many quarters, people cutting out with money, money is getting missing in different quarters, unaccounted for. And nobody so much. So why not ensure that the host communities get what they deserve? Sir. All right, Issa, uh, can the host community get what they deserve? I'm talking about 10%. Is it too much? We saw Zamfara, for instance, allowed <laughs> allowed to go with their, uh, I would say loot, but with their gold, make money and stuck it back into the system. Why shouldn't the Niger Delta get what they deserve? Uh, if you take into consideration that uh, probably they've contributed enormously to uh, the national good. I agree with you. They should 100% get what they deserve. But I have a problem with the leadership of the South-South. Okay, good. And the problem is we already have NDDC. You can see what's happening at NDDC. You can see the uh, amount of money that is being pumped into NDDC. And you cannot see the ripple effect in the life of the people in South-South. Sure. Then if 10% is given to host communities. I mean, look at the characters that even came to represent the host communities, yeah. throwing punches, you know, at each other because, you know, they want what it, it, or the other group wanted to represent, yes. you know, another group. So at, at that level, you don't even have unity. You don't have that, you know, unity of purpose yes. among them. So you can imagine if they are throwing punches at that level, if money is being released, yes. you can imagine what's going to happen. Yes. So for, for me, I just, I, I just feel that if... Even if it is 5%, even if it is 2.5% that is needed, I want it to be utilized. If you go to South-South, South-South is like mini Liberia. When you talk about poverty, when you see the average man on the street in South-South, you will begin to wonder if it is the same region that produces you know, the, the oil that actually Nigeria is enjoying. And the amount of money that is also going out there, one, one thing that they were also bitter about was that, okay, they have one of their own, the Minister for State, whom they think they participated yeah, yeah. in the entire process and allowed that amount to fly. So they were saying... But did you think he, he actually should change his people? No, I wouldn't say that, but you know, he's, he's a politician, for crying out loud. Yeah, so, so there's a limit to how he can actually push things because you also want to be in the good books of 
those who are the hem of our fear. So it's, it's the same thing that we have with fancy everywhere in Nigeria. Because he feels if he pushes too hard, you know, they might just go, okay, this man has taken enough, you know, take him off, bring him someone else who is going to do our bidding. So for me, I feel they should do what is fair or it is just. And not just doing that, but let us have a ripple effect and a multiplier effect of that in the host communities. Okay, blessing. How can we kick out this unruly uh, elders who seem to want to represent the, the people of the south, south, and uh, get genuine people who would, even if they're given the five percent, like you said, or the ten percent, they will use it wisely. Uh, are you convinced it will, will ever get that? Especially when you look at the NDC, the fainting drama, and recently the boxing match. <laughs> Okay, anything is possible. I like being positive. <laughs> we are set to do something, and then we put the right strategy on ground. We are going to achieve that. The way we want to get politics in everything, it will be like a game. It's there, it's a push here, and it comes to you. If you are lucky, you get it. If you are not lucky, you lose it. it. Yeah. We shouldn't play politics in some things. Now, taking from what, um, what my brother said, if you go to some of these first communities, seriously, they will be for them. In a quiet room, if you go to a place where more yeah. you eat. Oh, you're part of them, yeah, that's true. Self, self. More of you eat, you weep. You say, ah, what is going on? Is this. Okay, so this is the oil company. They call the okay. they they the oil city. They go to a cat, you weep. And then we target a glorified village. Why is it so? Yes, money is being fully shot. That's the, the, the seeds of money in the country, one of the seeds that people, everybody's eyes is on South South because of the oil. But why do we cheat them? They suffer, most of these communities suffer most. So, what we should do is, first and foremost, who are the ones in charge of this? It's not just giving projects to people and say, okay, approve this, approve that, and then you don't leave them to do whatever they want to do. Okay. Respect. We carry out um, 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 what? Do we go back to see what they are doing? Are they living up to expectation, or we just okay? It's been approved, and then the person disappears, is sent here, and do whatever he wants to do. So whosoever is in charge, I know some governors that when they are do one project to someone, like one governor, he will go there in the night to see what is going on, and he will go there alone. Maybe he can drive himself to that place and see what is going on. It's not just about okay. This should be done, this should be done. It's just, mm. When you are rest from the top, you'll be able to see that the bottom will start to align. All right, uh, well said. Uh, let's go to the next uh, talking point. Why the IGP is yet to be appointed is the big talking point in Nigeria in the past 48 or more hours. Uh, Isali Shatter, I know you have an idea why the IGP has not been appointed. We were told that uh, the president was in Dara and yeah. he's, uh, he should be in Abuja today and then hopefully we'll get the announcement. But uh, looking at uh, all the debate as regards to the fact that the Southeast was not represented in the recently uh, you know, uh, release as uh, uh, service chiefs. Do you think the Inspector General of Police, um, the pressure might make the president tweet and decide to say, okay, probably I'm going to get someone from the Southeast to become the Inspector General of Police? Or do you think, uh, like uh, the president we know, he's going to be hell bent to play uh, what he wants, the cards he wants to play? Uh, but for you, what are your expectations? Well, I, I don't think so. You see, when it comes to the issue of security, we need to actually expunge the. Um, item of ethnicity out of it. You know, we need to go with who is, who is next, actually. Well, has this president administration yeah, played I'm, I'm, I'm getting, that role? Yeah, okay. I'm getting there. See, right. Last year, there was a police act that was signed, you know, in September. Okay. Uh, it was passed by a National Assembly, assented by the president. And in that bill, it was said that um, the president was going to appoint IGP, who will not be less than the rank of an IG, uh, AIG. All right. Currently, if the if the IG goes, we have about five DIG, three DIGs that will be retired with ten AIGs, okay. leaving behind um, ten, uh, leaving behind um, three um, DIGs and twenty eight AIGs. Oh, but now, if you look at these numbers, what the presidency will be doing right now is trying to see through their CVs, okay. to see who is best fitted for the job. Now, the current IGP, I know, he has a very wonderful CV. 
he served with Interpol for eight years. Yeah, very intelligent officer. And um, I think the president will be looking, you know, towards that. Because if you want to equate what he has also done, you know, you will give him at least 60, 65, 70 percent pass back. Okay, I, I said the, the, the current IG. You gave him 60, 60 yeah, percent. Uh, yes. Why would you do that? Yeah, you see, when if you look at, there was a time they deployed um, some special force police to go okay. to Dubri. All right. There's, a, there's, I've forgotten the name of that town. It's, it's a bridge that. Um, that links Meluguri and Yobi. Okay. Then at that place, nobody can actually pass that place. Even the military, like the, the, military the, the military could not even take over that place. But when they sent those police special, special forces, forces. There, they were able to take over. That was why at that time a lot of people were clamoring that why not allow these police special forces go into Meluguri? There was a time last year when the president said he want, they wanted to remove the entire military. Right. You know, from um, not easy and and bringing police, but a lot of people were scared. But the truth is, we spend a lot of money to train these police officers outside the country. We should allow them to take care of the internal security of Nigeria. And to some extent, I think they, they they've also been able to clamp down on a lot of kidnappers. Okay. You know, we might not want to agree to that fact, maybe because of what is currently happening between Abuja, Kaduna Road, okay. and all that. But then. In terms of internal security, at least we will give the current IGP uh, a pass mark. Right, and I think sir. that is the, the, the template that the president will be looking at in selecting the new um, IGP. All right, sir, IG, uh, you've got a uh, supporter right here in the yeah. studio. Good <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, I don't know if uh, you're still going to score the IGP 60% or you're scoring him 90 or you're going to score him 30. Well, um, to be honest with you and to be objective and fair as much as I can, he's. Um, He's, he's, a, he's a fine gentleman. Is it his CV that is fine? Well, no, it has to deliver the goods. <laughs> just all this. Okay. You know, the, the challenge we have here in, uh, in this country is that uh, we make institutional matters personal. Okay. And then we now carry institutional resources yes. and then we cave it for individual use as well. Um, <laughs> the, the, the idea has tried its best. I don't want to sound uh, pessimistic. Okay. But um, during this tenure, there has been a lot of fallouts. I think we've had the worst riot in the history of this country where youths gathered and uh, so many things happened under his watch and he never smelled it. He never knew they were even happening. You can see a lot of brutality, police brutality, a lot of abuses, a lot of people. Nigerians who had the right to live in their own fatherland were, were brutalized, were, were, were tortured, a lot of them men killed by a special squad that he, he came to inherit and he did nothing about. And then if you also see the welfare of the police officers during his time, uh, sometimes a lot of things happen, you keep wondering who to blame. Uh, for me, I think they say when the head of a fish is um, rotten. rotten, you wouldn't be asking what's happening to the body. And the truth of the matter, there are so many things that are falling apart around within the country and there's some, something is really very wrong. You can see the welfare packages for police officers so bad, so poor. And in the same country where we have enormous resources that are being siphoned, that are missing, misappropriated, that are taking every day. So we, we, I don't want to just start blaming the IG in isolation. I'm blaming the system and the institution. There needs to be a general overhaul. Oh. Something needs to be done. All right, uh, bless you. Uh, do we still the concept of the army? deploy uh, female police officers, get us a female IGP, probably that would do the magic. Mm. Is it possible? Should, I think we should try that. So can, can we I speak to Mr. President? Mr. President, we have three hundred ladies on the road now. Yeah, we've got three hundred. I think we should try that because um, if you're not in the police force, you're not that any position that women has to come in makes a difference. We have All the time. To, yeah, we had one that came to a fight, called Jelly Amaru. Okay. She changed the narrative. You used to see the leaders your enemy, but she came to tell you that police is your friend and it was actually your friend. And you That's were not paying, uh, you didn't have to pay for uh, don't pay for pay. this. Wait. Don't pay for this. Why she was there? She, you don't pay for it. Okay. That's nice. And give kudos to her. So maybe we should try that option. The female yeah. IGP. Yeah.
All right, uh, President Muhammad Buhari, uh, your citizens are saying probably it's time for you to steal from the army the concept of uh, having a female IGP. Probably they can turn the uh, story around. Uh, we'll be seeing how that pans out. And if it happens that way, I'm going to give you guys lots of kudos if it happens that way. Probably you'll be at the inauguration. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, like you, he was saying, yeah. I was saying, why is the presidency still silent? Yeah. I think the silence is taking too long. <laughs> and uh, besides, I. Because it's not new that it's not just something sudden just happened to the IDP. They know yeah, by this time yeah, it should be going. Like should there should be a replacement before. Do you think now. he's likely to extend it? Like he's no, definitely he wouldn't. I know he wouldn't do that. But my only challenge is um, most times we want to sound ethnic. Of course, okay. we are we are multicultural and uh, really diversified. But I hope um, the president would appoint um, a sectional or favorably ethnic personality to him. Somebody maybe, let me not sound religious here. Or no, sound go ahead, go ethnic, ahead. But the truth of the matter is that uh, I know there's some agitation for a lot of quarters why okay. most of the appointments are held by certain people, certain religions, certain ethnic groups and things like that. So let's have um, something happening differently. But the, the, you might be disappointed because from the 28 AIGs and the um, 10 DIGs that are eligible. The higher percentage of that number is from the north. And if and there's a female among them. Okay. Let's see. Yeah. They have to be the way that female. So we are insinuating that the appointments will definitely be from the no, north. I'm just saying if it comes from the yeah. north, yeah. So it will be the look as if you know he's actually doing that <laughs> pedestrian. <laughs> and don't forget that Mr. President is meticulous. You know, the time it took to appoint the ministers. Maybe he's taking the same time to, again to, to appoint you know, the IGP. Who knows? <laughs> All right, uh, let's go to the next uh, talking point. All right, uh, we've got the next. Okay, uh, my producer is saying uh, time to go for a quick break. All right, in case you're just joining us, we're watching the, the headlines on Liberty Television. And I've got the most wonderful cast uh, talking about uh, the panel here. I've got Issa Lee Shatter from my far right. And uh, the next online is Godwin uh, Ame. And uh, we've got a blessing. Ambrose making up uh, the three very special panelists there digging into the issues uh, uh, panning out in Nigeria. We'll go for a quick break. Don't go nowhere. When we come back, there'll be lots of uh, stories to chew on. of Liberty Television and Radio. Do you enjoy our programs and entertainment? If yes, then we are excited to introduce you to our new Liberty TV installers right from your comfort zone. With just one phone call at very affordable rates, we can guarantee you the best professionals to handle your cable and satellite television needs at very affordable rates. Also, you can find us at to B7, 8 Sierra Plaza, Tivesta Ogo, Christian, Jabi Abuja. You can reach us on 081-609-09629 or 080-359-81503 or 
right, sir, welcome back from the break. You're watching Nigeria's most credible and compelling uh, press review show beyond the headlines on Liberty Television. I still have my fine guest in the studio. Uh, far right is uh, Isali Shata and uh, Godwin Ame is uh, in the middle of the park and we've got her blessing, Ambrose, uh, the only female. She is uh, the CEO of Bean uh, TV. All right, uh, let's kick it into Oge as we go straight to Kogi State where Isali Shata hails from. And the story there says... Nigerians, don't go to Kogi State, don't go to Okene, don't go anywhere close to anything KOGR. They are infested with COVID-19, says the PTF. That's the way some story. Is that not a bad uh, publicity for Kogi State? And the fact that the governor has always said, Kogi people, they, they have nothing to do with uh, COVID-19. I think every Nigeria would definitely be seeing it from the perspective that there's a bad blood between the PTF and um, Kogi State okay. governor. Okay. Because of his um, stronghold and standpoint that um, they don't have COVID in Kogi. Um, there were some group of people who actually said they commended the, first, um, the governor All right. you know, last year that you know, they, they loved the fact that he was the only governor who could speak out to say there was no point shutting down the economy at that point in time. All right. That the pandemic was not that you know, serious the way you know, they were emphasizing and exaggerating. And um, so at some point, you want to agree with him. At some point, you might disagree. But he made some, you know, he made some clear analysis. If you are saying, before, before I move into the analysis, if you are saying that nobody should go to Kogi State, Kogi State is like a condi pipe where almost everybody will have to pass through to get to where they are going to. It's in the middle. It's, Kogi State is bordering close to about 9 to 10 states. You know, for crying out loud. So what you are invariably saying is that you are invariably shutting down the economy if you say nobody should go to Kogi State because people will always go to Kogi State. They will pass through. And at that time, last year, when they were saying that there were increasing figures of you know, COVID-19, people were still passing through Kogi State and we seem not to have any serious case or any serious uh, problem coming from Kogi. I don't know what they did there. I don't know what the governor did. I don't know what the citizens were doing, even though the, uh, the citizens were not actually complying to those safety measures. But now that we're having the second variant, we've still not had enough you know, numbers coming from Kogi State. Maybe they are not carrying more tests, like they alluded that they are not carrying more tests in Zamfara, you know, Kassina and, 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 and Tigawa State, yeah. But the, the point here is there's a lot of controversy surrounding this COVID-19 you know, um, incident. For me, why are we suddenly even rushing to say we want to get vaccines? Because the vaccine com is coming too quickly. One, have we checked the potency of the vaccines we are going to get at the end of the day? Because the um, uh, manufacturers of these vaccines don't even take cognizance of um, Africa. Africa that constitutes about 20% of the world population. They don't even consider us. And we are running to Russia, India, and China to get you know, these vaccines, even though they said they have not done the third you know, clinical trial to prove that the vaccine is effective for consumption. So all these controversies are hanging there. But for me, it's, a, it's, it's actually you know, bad enough for PTL to come out and single-handedly you know, point accusing figure at one state to say nobody should visit there. They should look for a way to amicably resolve whatever differences there. Yes. Because what the governor has been saying, he said, look, I'm not interested in collecting money. I'm not interested in shutting down my economy. I'm not interested in anything that has to do with COVID fund because I know that there are a lot of exaggeration that is going on. That instead of us to you know, channel this amount of money into basic infrastructure, we are using it to play politics. So I feel there is something that we need to understand that is actually going on with you know, this COVID-19 saga. I mean, looking at what uh, Issa had just said and looking at the controversy that's actually chilled uh, Kogi State, uh, do you think the PTF has been uh, very firm in uh, trying to curb the spread of COVID-19? We saw what happened in Zaria during the death of the Emir. Uh, we saw recently the president going to Dara to revalidate his uh, APC registration. And uh, we had uh, about nine or more governors going with him. Do you think the government, on one hand, are preaching adherence, but on the other hand are flouting it to a very great extent. We saw when uh, Abakari died, uh, how people were jam-packed and even the disposing of uh, uh, the, 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 yeah, the, PP, the PPE worn by those uh, 
Yeah, the we're not properly decode. So is is a uh, of Mustafa and Co actually playing politics uh, because he also got uh, infected with COVID and his family. So if they were hearing that street, why did they also get uh, the middle of of it? Uh, it's really unfortunate that um, in Africa and especially in Nigeria, we play politics with everything. Yeah. We, just like I said earlier, we carry institutional resources and make it individual. And then we, we just like you, you rightly just said, you saw what the president did recently, mingling with uh, party stalwarts and not taking, going against the very law he promulgated. And uh, I think they're demanding six months uh, imprisonment for offenders. Uh, I don't know who is arresting anybody now. And it, they arrested yesterday. Okay. They are arresting the common man. Now, when the president forced <laughs> the laws and uh, his stone words, did anybody arrest anybody? Nobody. I think I said this on the platform, and certain people were uh, like um, attacking. I said the law is actually against the poor, the ordinary people. Um, the truth of the matter is um, they are playing politics. The PTF is playing politics with uh, public health issues like COVID. And uh, sometimes it goes through my mind. I wonder why. It has been emphasis on COVID-19 alone. There are a lot of public exactly. health um, issues that have been taking the lives of several Nigerians, and um, people have been silent about it. People have been, the government especially, have been doing very little or close to nothing about it. It's not as if we should not take precautionary measures with respect to preventing COVID-19. We should do all that we ought to do, but I think some people are really feeling their pockets from, from yeah, it. And like exactly. the Kogi state governor, right from the very onset, he has taken a very, very decisive antagonistic position with the yeah. PTF yeah. and uh, I don't think that has really put him in the good books with the PTF mm -hmm. and of course it's kind of like rubbishing what they are doing there and they will find every privilege to want to get back at him mm -hmm. so announcing publicly that uh, nobody should go to Kogi State is not um, the right step in the right direction because um, that could trigger negativity in the economy of uh, Kogi State and uh, bring a lot of setbacks so I think there should be more more objective approach to handling issues of disagreement than such an ad outburst. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, Rashid, let's uh, look at the fact that you will be some for our care team in Chikawa. Uh, we're about to uh, sing out for a regular you know, testing, that is a testing at all. Uh, what does this mean if you look at it? This is a more modern state. Uh, what does this tell us that some of you are even having more infection rates than it's been reported? Well, first and foremost, this is not a one doctor. This is not um, surprising that the only thing that could rise is the number of COVID um, cases. When they um, have just said the 240 COVID boys, they said it was only 10. They said 10 boys, yeah. That were adopted from the COVID. But COVID 19 is the only thing that could. Okay, um, during the process, <laughs> during the process, they said nobody died. Yeah. When they said um, SARS, killing so many persons in the country, they said no, it's not killing anybody. But unfortunately, COVID 19 is rising on a daily basis, which means COVID 19 is um, the child is growing. One day it will become an adult. So we don't even know what to believe again. That's the point. We don't know what to believe. Why won't you free people to so that we can carry people along with whether we are giving people or telling people to take people out of this place? Alright, so we can continue. Next talking <laughs> point, whether government malls, UAE and Netherlands uh, suspension of flight. And the big question is that uh, after Hadi Shirika said people were coming to the country with fake COVID-19 results and some of them didn't even have results. Uh, why are we still mourning whether we're going to suspend flights or not? Do you think this government is truly, I don't want to say responsible, but do you think they, they are really true to their word? Uh, when they say this, they act the other way. I think um, at, a, at some point, I'm tired and sick of, you know, when you talk about the issue of Nigeria, I think you talk about the issue of Nigeria till Jesus Christ comes. That's the truth, because it's endless. Last year, how did COVID-19 enter Nigeria? Just like what my sister was saying earlier, that the, the pe people, Nigeria, most especially those at the bottom of the pyramid, they see COVID-19 as the illicit sickness. And 
How did he come? How, how, how did the, the virus came in in the first place? It came in by people coming into Nigeria, either a Nigerian bringing it or a foreigner coming in. First, it was an Italian that they said tested positive. Now, we know that this virus actually travels from one person to another. And you must have contracted it from one point, you know, to bring it to Nigeria. Now, we knew that there was second variant. As we still speak, there are flights still coming from UK. There are flights still coming from, you know, almost in, in UAE. There are flights coming from, I don't know whether there's flight coming from South Africa. But the truth is, we know that these are the places that they have adjourned to be the epicenter of the second variant. But we fold our hands and watch. Instead, we come in and box in, you know, the, the, the common man to say, if you don't wear masks, you don't, how did the virus enter Nigeria? Because the common man, now if the vaccine comes, they want to impose the vaccine. That, I heard, the, I heard Bob Mustafa saying that if they wanted to kill us, they had better ways, that's the West, yeah. to get us because we consume too much of imported items. Who consumed them? Is it the common man? Let's, let's, let's call it spade a spade. Now, when the vaccine comes, even when the vaccine comes, I am guaranteeing you that there is no preaching NOA, no preaching any religious leader would do that will make the ordinary man to want to collect it. Because they don't even believe in it. That's the truth about it. So this cry about, you know, you know trying to shut down um, uh, one airline, for me, is inconsequential. Inconsequential in the sense that whether they shut it, whether they don't shut it, the fact is COVID-19 is here. COVID-19 will still be with us. So, but for the common man, they don't, the common man will tell you that, look, even if you stop all these airlines, we don't fly, we don't travel out. Mm. You guys are the one who utilize these um, uh, facilities. So why disturb our ears with all this, you know, hula baloo of whether you want to stop, uh, you know, this uh, flight, flight or not? For as long as the common man is concerned, this sickness, is, uh, this uh, virus is illicit. And as far as they are concerned, they don't even want to collect the vaccine. That's the honest truth. Okay, let's just jump into the other discourse. Uh, I mean, I just want you to look at uh, the federal government uh, still on COVID-19. It's now turning towards Russia and India for their own vaccines uh, because they, uh, according to them, they want to achieve 40% uh, vaccination of uh, the population by the end of 2021. Uh, uh, let's look at the federal government. Are they being realistic? Uh, do you think they, they are they spot on, they know where they want to head. Initially, they said China vaccine. Uh, there was a the UK vaccine by Pfizer. And now we're looking towards India and Russia. Uh, well, um, definitely, uh, it's a basic responsibility of the government as site security to ensure that uh, the citizenry are well placed. The public health service is, is absolutely adequate. But it's unfortunate that um, there's a lot of lip uh, service, service. Uh, in the sense that if you want to look at our health infrastructure currently now, you will know that it is absolutely below, far below, not just close to, but far below standard. And just like Bill Gates said recently that uh, instead of purchasing vaccines, Africa should concentrate on improving and building their health infrastructure. Uh, the government is not doing anything about improving and and then building new health infrastructure. Just like you, we, we, we discussed earlier on, we're talking about cylinders, shortfall of cylinders yes, in, yeah. Lagos. in Lagos. We're talking yeah. about um, the Lagos State Government trying to commercialize um, isolation centers. I mean, government-owned mm -hmm. isolation centers will be commercialized. Mm -hmm. The same government that have paid little or no, or just lip service to, to private sector participation and entrepreneurship, that so that people can get involved in all these things and not just everything should be about government. So there's a lot of lip service to the whole saga. And then uh, if I would advise adequately, the Minister of Health, in collaboration with every other party, should rather focus on improving our health infrastructure. Sorry, I, I forgot okay. to add earlier yeah. when I was telling you about the governor of Kogi State. Okay. He made some analysis. He said he's building a um, hospital a huge hospital with every facility that you can think of, including COVID-19, that is costing him just about 5.4 billion era. That but we are using almost 600 and, you know, as at that time he made the statement, 565 billion, billion yeah. you know, to buy vaccine. That if you 
calculate the amount of hospitals Nigerians will have if we use this amount of money we are going to use for vaccine to create basic infrastructure, healthcare delivery system in the entire state, some states are going to have two of those facilities that will be very, very functional. But we are not concentrating on that. Rather, we are basically facilitated about bringing in vaccines. That what I even feel the African continent should be doing is to look at how we can actually generate or produce our own vaccine here in the continent, rather than, you know, always depending on India, Russia, and China. Okay, uh, uh, Blessing, let's uh, to have your final take as regards uh, these vaccines. Uh, 10 billion naira was allegedly uh, released by the federal government for production of vaccine. My question is, uh, if we could produce vaccine, why wait until now before producing vaccine and uh, 10 billion? I think we talked about this um, last year, about the traditional... Yeah. Why don't we promote that? And then again, some, if something happens, it's an opportunity for you to improve on something that you did not have. COVID-19 came. We should start living with it. We should know that it's there. It's like when um, uh, AIDS came in, we're all panicking. Yeah. And yeah. Now, people are living with it. You just need to do certain things. And then you live even up to 120 years. You won't die. Now COVID-19 came. I think if the Minister of Health is smart enough, he would have seized this opportunity to improve in the health sector in the country. Instead of us pumping money to get what we are not even sure of. And then it's not even killing us as it's killing them over there. But there are some things, some basic things that we can do here, and then we get cured. Instead of us looking inward and say, what can we do? Trust me, if we associate to ourselves, we can produce vaccine for COVID-19 for pure COVID So do you think there's a deliberate attempt by persons in, uh, within the government not to allow that see the light of this so that we can Trust keep me, getting... people are smiling. People are, as you are complaining of no money, people are smiling because of <laughs> Are we not in Nigeria? All right. So we have okay. a deliberate okay. facility that okay. actually produces about 90% delivery uh, clinical test. test. Okay. okay. You know, they were just looking for money to upscale that to go to clinical level so that we can have a very effective and a very effective uh, vaccine. Yeah. I think uh, if I may add to that, uh, basically I think we have a culture of not promoting that. I remember oh, yeah. in uh, 1992 when uh, the issue of AIDS was uh, really at the, at the apex, the one doctor, Dr. Abalaka, uh, even till now, Dr. Abalaka is still saying he could do that. I know a lot of people could. But I know Africans are gifted. And if you see the best brains anywhere in the world in developed world, they are, they are basically Africans or Nigerians. And unfortunately here, there is an institution that is killing everything good. So I don't, I, I still believe, except, of course, we, there's nothing wrong with going the most scientific way, doing things alongside uh, the global uh, world acceptable practices. But right here, okay, look at the statistics now. You can see the number of those who have died of COVID-19, about a thousand something. Yeah. I don't think the number of those who died of common uh, illnesses malaria. like malaria, they are far beyond that. Yeah. And the government is not talking about malaria or talking about some yeah. simple ailments. It's all about, is it because the COVID-19 seems to affect uh, more of the air lights. No. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's look at these uh, two stories uh, before we wrap it up, if we can. Uh, we've got uh, COVID-19 vaccination. Africa is being left behind. Uh, United Nations wants. Uh, we'll also be looking at uh, 2023. Push for Jonathan intensifies. Then the uh, federal government fought global graft uh, ranking. Insists crusade is on course. Uh, let me start from blessing. Do you think uh, the global ranking was fair to Nigeria, or you think they were just out to make Nigeria look bad? In terms of uh, the, the ranking, uh, talking about uh, index for corruption index, the Transparency International Corruption Index, insisting uh, that the ranking does not uh, include great strides Nigeria had uh, won against uh, economic, you know, corruption. This is uh, like Mohammed talking now. Uh, <laughs> Do you agree with him that uh, the corruption index uh, does not paint Nigeria right? Yeah, you know uh, that we are fond of reporting something negative about us all. If you say whether we, if the, the report is correct or not, it is what we report. Nigeria is not that bad. 
I'm not trying to paint Nigeria in a <laughs> wide face. Okay. If you want to look at what other countries are doing, we might be surprised that Nigeria doesn't even near. Uh, but, uh, but we came out 140 <laughs> something out of 180 countries in terms of a uh, uh, list of corrupt uh, uh, countries in the world. Uh, don't you think that's bad enough when you are coming 140 something? That's what I'm saying. Yeah. It's bad enough because. But the Minister of uh, uh, Information and Cultural and Information, Lai Mohammed, does not think so. He thinks. Uh, Transparency International is just trying to paint Nigeria bad. Is he being realistic or he's just playing politics? Why won't you defend your country in the first place? Okay. You'll do everything to defend your country. But what I'm saying is, in terms of the ranking, it is what they gather. You know, when information goes out, out okay. it is a negative that spreads far and wide. Okay. If it does something good now, it will just, they will just celebrate it and then it dies it off. But when it is negative, oh, Nigeria. I told you when I, I attended a conference in Rwanda or sometime, okay. and I stood up to introduce myself. I said, my name is Blessing Ambrose from uh, the giant of Africa, Nigeria. Everybody was like, ah. And then we talked about social media. <laughs> we talked about social media. And then we said that we, we were just dissecting things about social media. And I said, come on. Somebody from, uh, from Kenya stood up and said, see, we don't trust Nigeria anymore. Because all the time, yeah, everything about them is negative, negative. And I don't even know if there's anything positive that happens in that country. You can imagine what other people are feeling about us. So it's what we, we report. And then one of the resolutions was that we should try and promote something positive that is going on in our country, not all the time negative. 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 All right. Okay, uh, Issa, I'm going to give you half a second. Uh, <laughs> God, you also have a second. Let's wrap it up. Uh, looking at uh, Africa being left behind in vaccination, the United Nations is warning. Do you think the United Nations is doing enough? It's not just to warn them. Can they do something to ensure that the continent gets its own fair share of vaccine? Uh, of course, I, the United Nations is playing a significant role in uniting the world, yeah. especially when it comes to issues of security and um, economy and their health. Uh, of course, they could do much More. better, but I, uh, my 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 particular concern is with Africa and Nigeria because most times United Nations will be making pronouncements that um that um, might be much more suitable for developed nations. Yeah, so it's more well public service. Yes, we have our own peculiarities, and I think we should know what exactly we want. Now, if United Nations is making a blunt, uh, general statement compared to nations that have that have a stable health uh, facilities, yeah. infrastructure, compared to Nigeria, in most of the, the, even in major cities, you can't even have a good hospital to, in major cities, not to talk about remote mm -hmm. centers and okay. uh, villages. All right, uh, Issa, quickly, uh, 2023 is the kicker, mm -hmm. <laughs> push for Jonathan Intensify. Are you, are you going to be excited seeing your ex-president come back, one more, taking one more shot at the presidency? Uh, and do you think he's going to succeed? Yeah, he might succeed because um, 2023 is a bit tricky. Okay. You know, they are looking at it. Okay, if he's going to contest, he's going to just do one term and go. He has done one term before. Oh, okay. But what has the um, um, bill that Mr. President just signed had also has to do with him? All right. Because he said if someone dies in office, you can only contest once. Okay. So if that applies to him, it means he's in, uh, in, in, uh, he's not eligible. Okay. Yes, he's, he's, he's actually not eligible to actually contest. Okay. Okay. But of course. There will be a lot of push, and a lot of people's eyes are not clear or clearer to know that okay, the man is not as you know widely corrupt as they actually paint you know painted him, or, painted him okay. uh, or weak. But now I feel he will be wiser. He's more he's more actually experienced, right. and he will be able to actually move in and get the job done. Okay, do you think that okay he's going to be fighting against Jagabran and Nicole? Yeah, <laughs> I, 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 don't know, I don't know how we're looking yeah. at this um, issue of Bruno yeah. Jonathan coming yeah. back for a second tenure, uh, especially under what uh, platform APC. Yeah. Okay. Now, why are we <laughs> doing a politics that is the okay. of ideology for God's sake? All right, uh, my, my, <laughs> so let, let the youth come, 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 come out. Okay. You know, Please, let the youth come out. Always have to my head. Be careful. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
the edition of the program. We have headlines on the same time to the entire production team. And I've always had one very uh, extraordinary guest who's always behind the camera, even behind the camera, but uh, I'm trying to remember his name. I know Mr. <laughs> James. Yeah, Mr. James. I want to say thank you to Mr. James, always keeping us company, even behind the scenes. <laughs> Thank you to this wonderful Nigerian uh, for making this program truly amazing.